I am loving this study, and I know we've done it before many years ago, but it's just so good. And as I've been preparing again and going through it again, oh my word, that it's like I am so amazed at how fresh revelation just constantly comes, you know. And I, you know, when I really felt the Lord saying we must do the armor of God study again, I'm like, oh, you know, we've done that. And I'm the type of person that I want to keep on learning something fresh and something different. I'm like, must we do the armor of God again? And the Lord was like, yes, you got to do it again. But in the preparation of it, it's just incredible how so much more has been um, unpacked and how the Holy Spirit is just showing more and more different aspects of the, of the armor. And so we are going to be doing the belt of truth today. I'm going to be getting into that now when I officially start the recording. Um, but I really just want to encourage all of you just to do your best to stay connected to the series. Um, I'm already busy working on a couple of the pieces of the armor ahead of, of today, and I am just loving it. I'm loving it, and I know that you too are going to enjoy every part, every session that we do. Okay, so let's officially get recording. I'm recording on a different way today on my phone. Uh, Lorna has been helping me. Thank you, Lorna, for your assistance. It's wonderful to have people that know things when you have no idea. <laughs> so let me just get my little picture on here. Um, if I can ask everybody, if you don't mind putting your audio on silent while I am getting myself sorted out here, um, then we can start. Where is it? There it is. Tick. I ticked it, Lorna. Where's Lorna? There you are. I hope I'm doing it right. <laughs> She's been tutoring me the last day. So I'm like, let's hope I'm doing it right. Okay, is everybody ready? Thumbs up for everyone that can see your faces. There we go. Wonderful. Let's get started. Well, as always, ladies, it is an absolute pleasure and joy and privilege to be with you today as we're getting ready to study God's Word. So I want to welcome you, whether you are listening and watching live or you're going to be listening to the recording, you are so very, very welcome. It is a privilege and an honor for me to present the Word of God to you and to come teach the Word of God. I really value it. It's not something that I do just because it's something that's nice to do. I do it because I treasure it. I treasure God's word in my life and I and I count it an absolute privilege and honor that you are here with me today and that you are giving me the opportunity to just share with you some insight and revelation that I believe that the Lord has given me. So let's get started with Bible study today. Can we just have a just have an opening prayer, just a quick prayer. Let's just calm our, our spirits and our minds and let's just welcome the Lord here with us today. Father, I thank you so much for this incredible opportunity to get together as women of God, as children of God, and to just sit around just for a, a, a brief moment in time and study your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll bring truth and revelation, that you'll help us to understand, you'll bring clarity of your word. I thank you that you've anointed me to deliver your word, and I pray that every word that comes out of my mouth will be fresh and pure and direct from your heart. I pray for a blessing time this morning in your word, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, ladies, let's study the word. It's time to be equipped. It's time to be equipped by God's word. And, and like I say every week, I feel in a sense that this is kind of like spiritual boot camp. We are, we are doing boot camp now through God's word. So let's start how we start each and every week with our anchor scripture of the year. For those of you who don't know, we have an anchor scripture every year, and, and the reason I do that is because it's something that I, I want us to repeatedly do each and every week, so that if there's only one scripture you happen to remember in God's word, it's the anchor scripture, and that is something that you can hold on to, and it can keep you steady and firm as you go through your day. So let's do our anchor scripture for this year. It is Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. Say it with me wherever you are. Proverbs chapter 30. And verse 5 says what? Every word of God is flawless, and he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. As women of word, as believers, as children of God, we choose, you and I choose to believe that every word in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation is flawless. That's what we choose to believe, right? Because that's what God's word says. So when we read God's word, we come from that standpoint that God's word is flawless. 
So as you know, we are doing the Armor of God study. And just from the beginning, I once again want to give credit to Rick Renner, a phenomenal Bible teacher that I love his studies and I love his word. And a lot of uh, what I bring to you today and throughout the study is from some of his material from Sparkling Gems. Um, but I have done a lot of my own study and my, a lot of my own research, but I want to give him credit because he is a phenomenal Bible teacher. So why did God give us the armor of God? God. Why did he give it to us? And how do we use it? Have you ever thought about that? Why did he actually give it to us? You know, when I look at where we are at the moment in, in time, I think 2 Timothy chapter 3, 3 comes across quite clear that we are living in perilous times. Do you all agree? We are living in perilous times. Times. 2 Timothy chapter 3 actually talks about it, that it says that the Bible says that men will become lovers of themselves. They'll become lovers of money. They'll become proud, blasphemous, slanderous, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And in, the, in, the, in this time, this perilous time, beside the virus, which is a global pandemic, which is happening, besides the virus, we see news of floods and earthquakes and other disease and civil unrest and global unrest. There really seems to be a lot of chaos going on around the world. And even when you put all of that aside, and you just maybe look at your own life and you might think, well, you know, my life is also looking a little bit challenging. Besides what's happening around me, maybe it's your body, maybe it's something physical, maybe something emotional or mental in a family relationship. We are, we are living in challenging times. And if we had to say, are we living in perilous times? We can say yes. Are we living in dangerous times? Yes. Are we living in scary times? Yes. But guess what's coming is that big word, but. And I love the word, but. And we know in the English language, when but comes in as a, compa as, as a conjunction in a sentence, I love the English language, when the word but comes in, basically what it's saying is what I'm about to say is going to supersede and override what I've just said. So what is the but? The but is that as children of God, as daughters of the king, we do not have to fear Yes, all of this is going on, but we do not have to fear. There are two scriptures you're going to hear me say over and over and over again, and maybe you're going to get tired of hearing me say it, but that's not a bad thing because hopefully it gets into your spirit. And the one is Romans 8.37. The Lord says, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. You are more than a conqueror. So even in this perilous time, when we are living with chaos around us, the word says you are more than a conqueror. Luke chapter 10 verse 19 is the second scripture. I love the scripture that says God has given us authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. And I add in there cockroaches, as you know from last week. God has given us authority to stand on snakes and scorpions. And he's given us authority over all the power of the enemy. All the power. God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And then the verse continues and says, and nothing will harm you. Now you might say, but goodness me, I feel like I'm being harmed in many ways. But the word says, this is what the word says, we've got to choose to believe it because every word of God is flawless. So that is the big but. We are part of the winning team. We are part of the winning army, ladies. That is, that is our standpoint. That is our confidence. So we have victory already. It's a done deal. Jesus gave us victory when he died on the cross and he rose again. So why do we need armor? Have you thought about that? If the word of God says that you have victory already, why is it that you need armor? So over the last two sessions, we've, we looked at the beginning part of the study in Ephesians chapter 6, and we looked at verse 10, 11, and 12. So let's just do a quick summary on that. You're all good with a quick summary? Ephesians chapter 6, verse um, 10, we know says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In summary, the word strong is the word dunamis. So God has put, then that word dunamis means a supernatural dynamite strength. You, in each one of you as children of God, you have a supernatural dynamite strength that resides in you. And it goes on to say, and power. That word power is the word kratos in the Greek, which means, this, which is the same power 
It's a supernatural manifest power, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, Ephesians 1, chapter 19 and 20. We read about that, the same word. So inside each one of us is a supernatural strength and the Kratos power of God, and God backs that with his might, his eschios in the Greek, his might, which is his, which is his power and his strength. So that's with it, which, what's in each one of you, in you and in me. Now, you may not feel it, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's true. That's what God's word says. You have the strength and power of God in you. Then the verse continues. In ver uh, let me actually just read it for you. Let's just read it. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And we saw from last week that the devil has a strategy and a plan to destroy you. That's not good news. I know. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody ever wants to hear that the devil's out to hurt you. But um, that's what God's word says. And that word scheme shows that he actually studies you and he watches you and he analyzes you and he sees what he can do to trip you up. He knows you because he watches you. It's like he's a, uh, what do you call it, a stalker. <laughs> he's a stalker. He stalks around and watches you and says, what can I do to trip Tracy up today? What can I do to get on her, get her on her back end? What can I do to cause her to get offended? What can I do to cause her to fear? What can I say or who can I bring her path to cause her to get upset and make her angry? He watches you and he knows how, what to do. Then the verse goes on, for I struggle or wrestle, or battle, we studied that last week, is not against flesh and blood. And I always love becoming light-hearted here and saying, your fight is not against your husband or your mother-in-law. <laughs> okay, that's not where your battle is. It doesn't lie there. Your battle is not against a person. It's not against a political leader. It's not against an institution. It's not against your neighbor. It's not against your child. It's not against your t the, the, the teachers in, in, your, in your, t your children's school. That's not where your battle lies. A battle is against the principalities, the powers of the darkness, the rulers of the darkness, and all spiritual wickedness. We studied that last week. And what I want to remind you of with this, ladies, is that we have a spiritual enemy. And because we've got a spiritual enemy, we need spiritual weapons. You cannot fight a spiritual enemy with natural weapons. You cannot use the art of negotiation when it comes to the devil. You cannot use tactics and human tactics or some type of a clever plan to try get him to stop his work in your life. No, you can't do that. You have to have spiritual weapons. And that's why God has given us the armor of God. And let's just read a little bit on here. Verse 13, therefore, put on, which is an action, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, which is here, <laughs> you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, stand. So that standing, and we, we covered this in the first session, when you stand, what you're actually doing, you have, you, it's an action of faith to say that even though I might be being chased down by the enemy, and even though I might be surrounded by the enemy, and even though they may not look like there is any hope, I stand firm in my trust and my hope that my God will save me and deliver me from this. When you look at the story in Exodus chapter 14 with the Israelites that when they escaped Egypt, when they left Egypt, you can go, go back to session one just to, to refresh your memory on that. So put on the full armor and once you've done everything, stand. Stand firm. In other words, trust God. Trust God. Okay, so we are starting the armor today. We're going to be looking at each piece of the armor individually, and today we're going to be getting, getting started with that. But before we do that, I think it's important for me just to explain to you so that you can fully understand why did the Holy Spirit in inspire Paul, because Paul wrote Ephe the book of Ephesians, why did he inspire Paul to, to describe our spiritual armory and compare it to Roman armor? Because that's the, the armor that he's talking about. Why did he do that? Why did he inspire Paul to do that? Well, very simply, his audience. His audience at the time, they were very familiar 
with the Roman army. They understood the significance of the armor. They, they understood the authority that it carried. They understood why the, the soldiers wore what they wore. So if that's the case, we too then need to study it. We need to understand so we can grasp the, the fullness of why Paul is comparing the armor of God to the armor that the Roman soldiers wore. So a little bit of background information. In 63 BC, a Roman general by the name of Pompey, he came in and he invaded, they invaded Judea in 63 BC. So then the Romans basically had control of Judea. In 39 BC, a man by the name of Herod was appointed as the king of Judea, King Herod, as you know. Now, interestingly, I went and studied this. I always thought that Herod was a Roman, but he wasn't. He was born an Edomite. His father was from the, the, the lineage of Edomites, but he was actually raised as a Jew as a Jewish boy, as a Jewish man. So he was then selected by the Roman state to then become King Herod, to become um, King of Judea at that time. So Paul himself, who wrote the book of Ephesians, he was actually born a Jew. He could speak Greek, but he was a citizen of Rome. So he, was, he felt very privileged, and we've done a study before about Paul. But um, that, that's just a little bit of background about Paul, because it's important when we read something in Scripture to see why did Paul compare it to the Roman armor? What is the reason? What is the significance behind it? Now, interestingly, and this, is, this is, was new to me, I didn't know this before, but when you read in the New Testament, you'll see many references to the centurions, the, the Roman soldiers. You'll, you'll see many references to them. And one of them you'll find in Matthew, chapter 8, when the centurion came to Jesus and said to him, please, will you come and heal my servant who is sick? And so that centurion, when, you've just, when you figure out who are these people, the centurion was part of the Roman armor, um, military, but he was very high up in the, in the military. Um, in our terms, maybe you would call him a, a major or a brigadier um, in, in the army. And at that stage, a centurion would, be, in order to get to that point, would be part of the army for about 16 years, roughly. So he was a very strong leader and he was a very strong soldier. So throughout the New Testament, you see lots of reference to centurions, lots of reference to Roman culture. So the reader of the time was familiar with the Roman army. They were familiar with the influence and the authority of the army. Okay, so that's the background information as we now get into it. So what did the Roman soldier look like? What, 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 what was so spectacular about him? Well, something that was interesting about, about the soldiers, the Roman soldier in particular, they were covered from head to toe with armor. From the head to their toes. There was armor basically all over them. They were fully covered with the armor. And also, which was amazing about the Roman soldier, because of this, you'd be able to recognize them coming from afar. As the soldier was walking in a distance, you wouldn't even have to figure, like, question, hmm, who is that? You would know immediately just by the way that he was walking, the, 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 his mannerism of walk, and by the way that he looked, you'd be able to immediately identify him as a soldier. Now, my question to us, to you and me is, does the enemy recognize that you are part of the army of God? Does he? Are you fully clothed with the armor? It, the way that you walk and the way that you are dressed, and I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually, is it recognizable that you are part of the army of God? Now, Ephesians chapter 1, 13 tells us that when we, when we become born again, we become sealed by the Holy, the Holy Spirit seals us. In other words, he puts a mark on us. So as soon as you become born again, it is, it's made obvious to the spiritual realm that you are now a child of God because you now carry the seal of the Holy Spirit. But now even the Roman soldier, he might be a soldier, but if he's not wearing his armor, he would not be distinguishable. So are you recognizable. When the enemy looks at you, does he see this child, this woman, she's part of the army of God. So the armor, it also showed the station and the status of the soldier. It showed which, which um, part of the legion he belonged to, um, you know, because there was all different legions. A legion was roughly about 6,000 soldiers. So it showed which legion they belonged to. Without the armor, he would just look like a civilian, right? He would just look like a normal man. Now, the same applies for you and I. Without our armor, we just look ordinary, when we're not using the armor of God, we just look like a civilian. Now, if a soldier who was, who was a soldier went into battle without his armor, what do you think his enemy would do? 
the enemy would probably have laughed at him like, are you kidding? I know you are a soldier, but what are you doing trying to fight me without your armor? Likewise, the enemy knows that you and I are a child of God because of the seal of the Holy Spirit upon us, but we still need the armor of God. We've got to have the armor of God. It's an important part of what God has given us as children of God in order to stand firm. So wearing the armor makes, made a very loud statement as a Roman soldier. When he put on his armor, it showed that he was part of an army and it showed that he was ready for battle. And the fact is, there is a battle. We cannot be naive and say there is no battle. Whether your life is full of chaos or it's full of peace, there is still a battle. There's a constant battle that is raging on in the heavenlies. We know that Jesus has won. Jesus has given us victory. I've, I've explained that before and I'm going to keep on saying it. The enemy is defeated. He is defeated. He is under your feet. That is a fact of the matter. But every single day, the enemy is going to come and try bring you down. John 10 verse 10, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Every single day, he's going to do that. How does he do that? Mostly through your mind. He's going to try to bring accusations, try to make you feel that you're not good enough. He's going to attack your identity. He's going to attack your self-worth. He's going to do what he can to bring pain and offense and confusion and fear. He does that all the time. So yes, Jesus has given us victory, but that doesn't stop the devil from still trying to take you down. Doesn't stop him. Okay, so for the soldier, what did it mean for the soldier to be part of the army? What did he need? One of the things that is obvious, he needed discipline. The soldier knew that he needed to train every day, even when he was not on the battlefield, even when there wasn't a battle to fight, he still needed to be training. Yep. I'm hoping that you're seeing a, uh, the analogy that's coming through here. You might think, well, you know, praise God, all is well in my life, everything's fine. Even when there is not a battle to fight, Training needs to take place. The soldiers would train for hours every single day. They would be disciplined. They would understand the rules and the regulations of their army. They wouldn't um, be a Roman soldier but then adopt Greek culture or the culture or the value system of another army or another people. That was crazy. They were disciplined in what the Roman army expected of them. They were disciplined in, in the rules of the army, of what they needed to follow in order to remain a soldier in the army. They were very disciplined. They were also very courageous. Even if they maybe felt fear, they were still very brave in the fact that they were willing to go out and go into battle. They had a lot of courage. One of the reasons they had so much courage, courage is because they generally really trusted the commander. Now, every legion had a legionnaire, someone that was in charge of the legion, but then there would be a legionary commander, someone that was in charge of all the legions. Now, that guy, the commander, the commander-in-chief, is someone who gave the instructions, and the soldiers had to follow the instructions of the commander to a T, to a letter. If they were marching in battle and, the commander, and they were walking this direction and the commander said, stop, change direction, walk right, boom. They didn't question it. They didn't wonder, why are you saying that to me, commander? This is a really nice route that we're walking right now. Everything is really peaceful and, and I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying this, uh, this, this direction. Look at the pretty scenery. They didn't do that. If the commander gave them an instruction and said, turn now, they turned. If the commander said, stop now, they stopped. If the commander said, get up and now let's run, they would get up and they would run. They would listen to the instruction of the commander and they would follow it to a T because they understood that the commander had a different perspective to what they had. So they were on the ground. They didn't necessarily know what was happening on the commander's level. You and I are on the ground. We don't know. We can't see what God sees. God's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He, he sees all. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. So God is our commander. And when God says to you, stop, you got to stop. you got to listen. you got to trust him enough to listen to his lead. When God says, don't do that, you're going to hurt yourself. You're gonna, you can't say, but God... You know, Lord, everybody is doing it. It feels so fine. I don't think there's a problem with this. If God's word 
says to you, don't do it, you don't do it. We have got to get to the point where we start taking what God's word says and start listening it not as like a legalistic command, but God's instruction to us to ultimately lead you and protect you and direct you on the path that you should go. So these soldiers, they followed the instruction of the commander to a letter and God helped them if they didn't. Yo, I went and read up about what would happen to a Roman soldier if he disobeyed the commander. It's not pretty. <laughs> it's really not pretty. It's actually pretty gruesome, as a matter of fact. They would inevitably die, but it wouldn't like they would just be stabbed or throat slit or anything like that. They, they would have torturous deaths. So we thank the Lord for his grace and mercy that that doesn't happen to us. But if the Roman soldier stepped out of line and disobeyed a commandment of the commander, he would die. There was absolutely no room for disobedience. None whatsoever. Because the commander knew that he needed to have soldiers who would obey. Otherwise, his army would be in danger. Now, like I said, thank the Lord that when you and I are disobedient, God's grace covers that. God's grace covers it, and we say, thank you, Jesus, for that. We really are grateful for God's grace, right? But something that we can learn from this is that we've got to have that same understanding that God is God. He's our commander. And if he tells you to do something, do it. Does that mean you can't question it? Well, of course you can question it, but still do it while you're questioning it. Do it. Do God's word. Be obedient to what God says to you. And I'm talking about through his word. This is how God talks to us. This is his instruction. This is his, his commands to us. This is his guidance to us, is through his word. So as people in God's army, I once again want to remind you again, the enemy is defeated. He is defeated. Colossians 2.15, I spoke to you about this last week. When Jesus died and rose again, the word says that, that Jesus stripped the enemy and all of his cockroaches of all of their weapons. He stripped them dry, bone dry. He stripped them of everything and he made a public spectacle. He humiliated them in front of all of heaven to show that the enemy is defeated. And we can all say praise God to that. I would love to watch the, the, the review on that, the video. You know, I wonder when we're in heaven, if, if I can just ask God, please rewind that. I want to watch that. I want to see what it looked like when the devil was stripped of everything. So we know that the devil is stripped. We know that he is a defeated foe. But in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1, there's a great scripture that says, when you go and see chariots and horses, do not be afraid. God is with you. How can you not be afraid in today's time? Because we know that the enemy is defeated and we know that God is with us. Nonetheless, if there was not a battle to stand firm in, we would not need armor. And the reason I keep on saying this is because I've read a lot of articles and blogs and different people's thoughts and processes on this that says, because of what Jesus has done, we do not have to do anything. I'm having a pause of, uh, I'm having a coffee sip, so you can all ponder on that. Because of what Jesus has done, because he died and rose again, it's all done, it's sorted, it's sealed, <coughs> praise God, life is good, we don't have to do anything. I've heard many people say that. The book of Ephesians was written after Jesus died and rose again, okay, it was written after. So Paul is saying here, even though we have victory, even though we have more, we are more than conquerors, there is still a battle to fight. You still have to be fully dressed. You've got to put on the armor of God. Let's have a look at the armor. The first one we're looking at, we can read in verse 14. Let's go back to verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, Stand. Verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And we stop there. Some translations say the loin belt, the belt of truth. So here's a good question for you. What is truth nowadays? What is truth? Who decides? Who decides what's true? You know, I absolutely love watching debates. 
I really, I was part of my debating team, everybody. Yes, when I was in high school, I was the captain of my debating team. I love debates. I love watching them. I love listening to the way that people can't argue each other. But here's the interesting thing about a debate, especially when you watch a political debate. Ooh. Both sides are convinced they are right. It's not like the one is like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not too sure on this point. You might be right. You never hear that in a political debate. Both parties are 100% convinced they are right. So who decides? Who decides what's truth? In a, dem in a democratic republic, you'd say, well, the people then decide according to your votes. So let me ask you this question. If in a country or in a, in a, in a, in a land... If the entire country decided that if you stole something, your hands were allowed to be chopped off, and that was okay, what do you think about that? If that child that's really hungry because he hasn't eaten in a week goes and steals the apple from the vendor, and the law of the country says, well, everyone has voted, the child's hands can be cut off, how do you feel about that? Yeah? I mean, that's extreme, right? Oh, here's another extreme one. What happens if some people say that, you know, if you fall pregnant and you don't want the baby, you can kill the child? <laughs> Who decides? Who decides what's true? I love what my husband says. He says, everyone has opinions. They're kind of like armpits. We all have them and they all stink. <laughs> That's what my husband says about people's opinions. So who decides truth, ladies? Who decides it? As Bible believers, that's you and me, as women of word, wow, that's you and me, we believe what the word of God says. John chapter 17, verse 17 says that your word is truth. God's word is truth. Please bear in mind, the word of God has been around a whole lot longer than any political party that's currently existing today. True story? Yep whole lot longer. This has stood the test of time through governments after governments after governments after governments after governments after school board after school board after governments. This has stood the test of time. So your word is truth. Psalm 119, 160 says, the entirety of your word is truth. The entirety of the word is truth. Our anchor scripture, as a matter of fact, Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God is flawless. Another word for flawless is true, accurate, truth. The word of God is truth. John 8, 31, 32 says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So what is truth? Who decides? Who decides? When it comes to big decisions in your life, who decides? Which opinion do you listen to? When you're trying to make a big moral decision about something, maybe it's a real moral dilemma that you are facing. Who decides? Do you go to Google and start Googling, what do I do when I da 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 da? What happens when my son da da da? What, what do you do? Who do you go to for truth? Because God's word is truth. The word of God is true. Why do you need truth? Why do you need God's word? Well, in a world where anything goes, as long as it makes you feel happy, we need a moral compass. Come on, people, we need a moral compass. How are we going to know? If Johnny, who is very eloquent and speaks really beautiful, is debating with Sam, who doesn't speak that eloquently and is not making any sense, who do we decide? Do we automatically go with Johnny just because he's eloquent? Do we automatically go with Sam because we feel sorry for him? Who decides? In a world where there's so much confusion, we need a moral compass. We need, we need something to tell us what is right and what is wrong. There has got to be a constant standard. And you cannot say, well, the standard has to change because of society. That's bunkum. It's nonsense. And I, I'm, I'm in a private Bible study here, so I can say that's nonsense. It's rubbish. It's garbage. Now, some people can't say that you can say that in church. Well, I can. It's bunkum. It's nonsense. You can't say just because society feels that it's okay, that it is okay. You can't do that because society is morally decaying. So we have to go back to truth. This. The word of God is constant. It is solid. It has stood the test of time. 
This is truth. Psalm 119 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. God's word guides us. God's word directs us. God's word enlightens us. God's word shows us what is true. What is true? I'm going, to go, I, I, I'm going to be very extreme in an example that I'm going to give you here. And please know that when I give examples and when I, when I share things like this, I'm not doing it to belittle or offend anyone. Please hear my heart. But I'm also trying to be, be, try to show you what is going on in the world. There is now a thing called Transpet. I don't know if any of you have seen it or watched it or heard of it. When a human identifies with an animal. I'm just going to pause there so you can all just let that sink in. It's called Transpet. Um, I, I think that there's two main ones at the moment. It's Pup and Pony. Pup and Pony. So Transpet and Pup and Pony is when I, I watched the one story of um, two men where the one man uh, is transgender. So he's, he identifies as a woman. He's biologically male, but he identifies in his head as a, as a female. I'm just trying to get the story right now. Yes. Two men, but the one identifies as a woman. But the one that identifies as a woman also identifies as a pet, as a, as a puppy, as a dog. So what this person does, they have, uh, they have got gear that they wear, like special masks, like dog masks and tails. And when they go into role play, the, the trans pet pup, the male who's a female who's now a puppy, um, walks around barking and the human uh, has a leash and trains, trains the puppy and strokes its head and feeds it and disciplines it and this transgender pup, uh, get very confused, um, runs around the garden and the human loves it. And then they switch out of role play, um, and then he's back. But, oh, by the way, when he's a pup, he's a male pup. He's Tony, as a male pup. So then he switches back to being male. It's very confusing, people. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm saying it slowly, because I'm trying to remember what I watched, because it was so disturbing. And you think, is this true? It is true. It is really happening. It's really happening. Now, the person who was interviewing them said, well, what's, do, you know, do you, what do you think about people that say this is crazy? And they say, well, this, it's not hurting anyone. We just do it for ourselves, and this is something that we do. We're not hurting anybody. I'm like, people, you are hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. And then they had this vote on this, on this forum that people could say yes or no. Like, do we accept this or do we not accept this? Do you know that the majority of people accepted it? The majority of people accepted it. So where are we going in this world? So one day we're going to be walking down the streets or in the shopping center and we see a pet trans pup, a pet trans pony. And, and then they ask, the, they ask the person, why not a dolphin? Why don't you identify with a dolphin? And then the, the person's response was, um, because uh, dogs are more lovable. And then the person interviewing them said, well, isn't that bigotry? How can you determine if a dolphin is less lovable than a dog? <laughs> I'm not being offensive to anyone. That person has um, some type of body dysphoria, and th that's the fact. That is not true. They are giving in to lies of the enemy. How do we decide, ladies, where's the moral compass? When do we say enough's enough? There's now a movement going on in Europe, I believe, that we're, it's, it's now become accepted for paedophilia. As long as they're not hurting the child, they're using animated figures at the moment. That as long as they're not hurting anybody, um, it's fine. But they, 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 they are sexually attracted to children. Where does, the, where does it stop? Where does the line end? Because if we just allow everybody to go with what's true for them and what makes them happy, the whole of society is going to start crumbling down to pieces. The word of God has to be your standard. This is your truth. And, and it has to apply to all areas of your life. You can't just say, I believe the word of God when it comes to my finances, or, but I don't believe it, the word of God when it comes to sexual identity. I'm being true here with you, ladies, and I, I want to speak truth with you. You can't say I believe God's word when it comes to salvation and grace and love, but I don't believe God's word when it comes to forgiveness. You can't do that. 
You have to believe the word of God in its entirety. The whole word of God is flawless. So now let's have a look at the belt. So we're talking about the belt of truth here. The belt in the, in the Greek comes from the word baldric or baltius, which literally means to tuck your clothes in. But the main purpose of the belt was to hold all the weapons in place, or most of the armor in place. Everything rested on the belt. The breastplate of the, the, the soldier's armor rested on the belt. The sword had a space in the belt that it would rest in. The shield had a little hook on the belt that it would lean on. So the belt um, carried the weight of a lot of the pieces of the armor. The rest of the armor would literally fall apart. It would have nothing to hold onto if the belt of truth was not in place. You see, you can have faith or think you have faith, but if your faith is not based on the word of God, it's eventually going to crumble. You can think you're very righteous, your breastplate of righteousness. We're going to do that next week. Such a good one. You can think that you are wearing the breastplate of righteous and you, righteousness, and you can think that you are righteous, but if it's not based on the word of God, it's going to fall apart. The word of God, the loin belt of truth, is what it all rests on. What did the belt look like? The belt was very distinctive. It was very decorated. It had buckles and it had pieces of metal and attachments. It was incredibly heavy and it was eye-catching. But what I find most interesting about the belt is that the belt had, it made a jingly sound. Because of all the little attachments on it, it made this little jingle jingle sound when the soldier walked. So as the soldier walked, there'd be this clink, 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 clink. So if you were sitting around the corner and you, you would know that a soldier was coming by the sound before you even see him because you would recognize the sound. Also, the belt itself was very heavy and because of the weight of the belt and of course the rest of the armor, it would cause the soldier's stance to change upright. At the manner of the way the soldier walked, would be, the soldier would be forced to walk uprightly because of the belt. Next week, when we do the breastplate of righteousness, you're going to see how this fits in beautifully. Righteousness is based on God's word, not on your works. Righteousness is based on what God says, not on your opinion. So when we've got the word of God wrapped around us, our loin belt of truth. It forces you to walk distinctively. It forced the soldier to change his stance simply because of the belt. The belt also showed, and this for me is very important, the identity of the soldier, who he belonged to, and his authority. As a matter of fact, if a soldier stepped out of place, stepped out of line, not like in a hectic way, like obey, disobeying a command from the commander, but if he stepped out of line, his immediate person in charge of him would remove his belt as a, as a sign of humiliation, and it would be like a dishonorable discharge to that soldier. So the belt was the part of the armor that was taken from him if he stepped out of line, because they understood that the belt was something that was so significant, correlating with his identity and with his, author his authority. So practically speaking, the belt would hold the weapons in place. Symbolically speaking, the belt showed status and who the soldier belonged to. Let's now apply that to you and I. Another sip of coffee for those who are listening. Let's apply that to you and I. When the word of God is operating in your life, when you're following the word of God as your truth, when it's wrapped around you as your truth, you will notice there will be a distinctive sound that will come out of your mouth. You will sound different. You will sound different to the people around you. I was with, we were with a client the other day, and the client was talking about uh, how she wishes that her children would leave the country because there's no hope, and they, you know this is scary, and there's no hope for the future, and blah, 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 and, she's, and she was going on and on and on about this, a Christian client, and my response to her was, I hear what you're saying, but Jeremiah 29 says that God has given me a, a plan for my life and for my children's life, which includes a hope and a future, and I do not believe that that's based according to the country I live in. <laughs> I'm ruffling feathers. I can feel it. 
I do not believe that God's plan for your life, which is a hope and a future, is based in the boundaries of the country you live. Come on, ladies. God's not bound by time or space. Do you think he's going to be bound by boundaries or governments? Do you think that Daniel prospered in a heathen country? Esther prospered with a heathen king. David prospered in a land where he was being sought after to end. They were trying to murder him. All of these characters, they prospered in this situation because God was with them. And when I said this to her, she got a little bit ruffled. Like a little bit ruffled. She's like, yeah, but we must also use wisdom. I'm like, absolutely, we must use wisdom. If God gives you a direct, clear word to leave the country, then by all means, do it. But you don't run because of fear. You don't run because you're afraid. You run because God has said it. If God has spoken it, you say it. You see, when you apply God's word in your life, you will sound different to everyone around you. Even your fellow soldiers. Even those that are in the army of God with you, you will sound different to them because what's coming out of your mouth is truth according to God's word. That's what's coming out of your mouth. When you're in a situation where everybody is talking about another person and and, and maybe mocking someone or doing whatever, what sound is coming out of your mouth? Because you see, whatever's in the heart will flow out of the mouth. And if God's word is on the inside of you, what's going to come out? What is going to come out? Are you going to participate in that mockery? Or is something going to come out of your mouth? What is going to be in the opposite spirit according to God's word? Love, forgiveness. When you have God's word, the loin belt of truth, you will sound different. There will be a distinctive sound. When you open your mouth, the enemy will recognize the sound of God's word before he even sees you. Because he knows God's word himself. He's afraid of it. He's particularly afraid of it when you apply it. So it gives you a distinctive sound. (coughs) What also the word of God does, it changes your mannerisms. Changes the way you live. It makes you stand up more uprightly. And once again, we'll be looking at that next week, very particularly on the breastplate of righteousness. But it changes your mannerisms, the way you live, the way you make decisions, the way that you operate, the way that you um, decide on what you're going to do here, what you're going to do there, the way you talk to your children, the way that you influence your children, the way that you speak to your husband, the way that you deal with your community, the way that you handle business, the way that you make decisions about your money. All of this will be changed. It changes your mannerisms simply because God's word is your loin belt of truth. It changes that. And all of that is wonderful, but for me, what's most important about God's word in your life is that it makes you understand your authority and your identity. And that's most important for me because goodness me, our people's identity is skewed up. Woo! Pup, pony, who knows what? (laughs) Seriously, what are you going to do if your child comes to you and says, I think I'm a puppy? And I'm talking about your child being 25, not five. It's one thing when they're five years old and they're doing role play. But when they're 25 and they're still calling themselves a puppy, what are you going to do? (laughs) You see, God's word, when God's word's in your life, and when God's word is operating in your life, your identity will be solid. Your authority will be solid. If somebody had to come to a Roman soldier during that time while he's fully dressed and somebody said to the Roman soldier, are you such a peasant? You're such a slave. You're such a useless individual. What do you think the Roman soldier would have done? He would have said, what? Are you crazy? Can you not see what I am wearing? He would point to his belt and say, look at my status. Look at my identity. I belong to this army. I belong to this legion. I am part of the Roman army. I am not a slave. He would laugh it off. He would think it's a joke. Now you see, you and I as children of God, we have got, if we've got God's word wrapped around us and it's in us and we are living it. And when the enemy comes and says this to you, why bother? Nobody cares. You're useless. You've got no value. Do you think anyone cares what you think? Maybe just be quiet. Don't talk. Oh, don't bother loving her. She's hurt you so many times. 
Forgive rubbish? You don't have to forgive. That's nonsense. Anyway, you're so weak. You could never do it. You see, when the enemy starts lying to you like that, and you've got God's word in you, and your identity is wrapped up in God's word, it doesn't matter how he attacks your worth. Your identity and your authority is solid. Is solid. You've heard me say this before, and you'll hear me say it again. Often when I hear the devil talking to me and throwing thoughts in my, in my, in my ears and in my mind, I'll say to him, please stop being eye level with me. Get down on the ground. You're under my feet. The word of God says you're under my feet. So if you want to talk, you talk to me from the ground, you cockroach. Don't you dare come eye level with me. You know we're close to my authority. How can I say something like that? Oh, Tracy, you can't speak to the devil like that. Oh, you bet your bottom socks I can because that's what the word of God says. And because I have God's word in my life, I can do it. I speak from, from the authority that God has given me, that I, have, that I have been given through Jesus. I can speak that way. I can speak that way. So does the enemy ever talk to me? Well, of course he does. Not so long ago, or quite a few, when I say not so long ago, a few years ago, I remember a very distinct time when the enemy was saying these things to me, attacking my self-worth, attacking my value in the kingdom, attacking my um, challenging what I believed to be true since I was a little girl about God's calling upon my life. And I started to feel sorry for myself. Yo, lady, self-pity is one of the worst things. When you get to that place of self-pity, the devil starts celebrating. He's like, hey, boys, bring out the champagne. She's in self-pity mode. Whoop, whoop, time to party. She's feeling sorry for herself. It's time that we celebrate. We've got her. Yeah. When you're at self-point pity mode, the devil feels that he's won. It's a dangerous place to get to self-pity. I was at that point. I was starting to feel sorry for myself. Oh, nobody loves me. Nobody sees what I'm doing. I may as well just give up. What does it matter anyway, you know? Nobody really, like, it's not making a difference, maybe to one or two people, but not like in a greater sense. You know what I'm saying? What lies does the enemy tell you? What schemes does he use to get to you? And when I started being feeling self-pity for myself in this way, I remember so clearly the Lord gave me a word and reminded me of a word that he gave me when I was very young. I was probably about 21 or 22 when the Lord gave me this word. And the word that he gave me back then, I'm not going to give you the whole thing, but basically he said to me then that I am a warrior princess. From a very young age, he gave that word to me. And this word rose up on the inside of me. This revelation rose up on the inside of me. And I'm like, hang on, if I am a warrior princess... I shouldn't be sitting like this. If I'm a warrior princess, I shouldn't be talking like this. If this is how God sees me, why am I looking at myself as a, as a weakling, as a peasant, as someone that means nothing? And that word rose up on the inside of me and smashed the lies of the enemy. But if you don't have the word in you, you will give in to the lie. You will give in, you'll stop believing it. You'll start making the lie your truth. Why is it that most women and men, but particularly women, battle with their thoughts when it comes to their value? Why is that, ladies? And once again, I'm not doing this to hurt anyone, okay? I'm not saying this to offend anyone. I'm asking you the question, why? Maybe your parents told ugly things about you. Maybe your whole family said ugly things about you. Maybe the community was saying ugly things about you. Maybe your whole life, all you've ever heard was ugly things. That might be your, your case. That might be your situation. If that's the case, this truth needs to get into you, my friend. This truth needs to be something that becomes what you are actually start listening to, speaking and believing. And as soon as God's word comes into you, it overrides all of those rubbish lies. You may have been told from a young age that you're useless. That is a lie from the enemy because God's word says you are precious to me. You are the apple of my eye. You are worth more than anything. My banner over you is love. I've seated you on heavenly places. I've made you an heir with Christ. Your inheritance is with me in heaven in eternal glory. That is what God's word says. Come on, get out of the pit. Get out of the self-pity pit. We've got to believe God's word. We've got to start making God's word our truth. 
And a final note that I want to mention here about what happened with the soldiers. If they ever got into a point where they felt that they desperately needed money, the part of the armor that they would generally sell would be the belt. They would sell the belt to get some cash, go get some mullah, so that they could feed their bellies or give in to their lusts of their flesh. How often do we sell out on the truth of God's word just for a moment of pleasure or for a moment of giving in to the lust of the flesh? I know what God's word says about that, but oh, I can't help myself. This just feels so good. I know what God's word says about forgiveness, but I can't help myself. I am not forgiving. That's it. I, I heard a lady say yesterday, I overheard it in conversation. She said this word, the best birthday present you can give me is revenge. Phew. <laughs> she was talking about her ex. The best birthday present you can give me is if I can have revenge on him. My heart broke for her. My heart broke. Christian woman. See, in that moment, she's willing to sell her identity. She's willing to sell out on the truth for maybe a moment of pleasure, giving into the lust of the flesh. How often do we do that? How often do we do that? I want to read you a short extract from Rick Renner's book, Sparkling Gems. Here it is once again, if any of you ever want to get hold of it. It's a phenomenal devotional. Love it. He says here, as long as the loin belt of truth, the word of God, is central in your life, the rest of your spiritual armor will be effective. But the moment you begin to ignore God's word and cease to apply it to your life on a daily basis, you'll start to lose your sense of peace and righteousness. Hmm. We'll talk about that next week. You'll find out that the devil will start attacking your mind more and more, trying to fill it with lies and vain imaginations. You see, when you remove God's word from its rightful place at the very core of your life, it won't be long until you begin to spiritually come apart at the seams. If you want to stay clothed in your spiritual armor, you must begin by taking up God's word and permanently affixing it to your life. The word of God must be central. It must be. Before we even get onto the rest of the armor, you've got to make the decision that the word of God is going to become central in your life. You have to make that decision. So let's end this time by me asking you this question. Does God's word have a central role in your life? Does it? How do you know? Well, very simply, when stuff happens in your life, what is the immediate response? Is the immediate response the truth or people's opinion? Is the immediate response to go pick up your phone and start Googling, what do I do when my friend betrays me? How do I find love? What, how do I deal with this issue in my life? What is your first response? Because yes, it's good to seek advice from other sources and to ask friends. I have no issue with that. But what's your first response? Does God's word have a central part in your life? Does it? The next question, what would need to change in your life in order for you to give God's word more space in your life? I'm not saying that we must sit 24 hours a day and read God's word. That's not possible. I'm not saying that. But what do you need to do to change something in your life in order to give it a space in your life, to give God's word some type of featuring in your life? Do you need to maybe wake up a bit earlier? Maybe go to sleep a bit later? Maybe not spend so much time reading that book or that TV show? Do you need to make a decision just like you will make a decision to exercise for 45 minutes a day for those of us who do that? Do you have to make the decision to put time aside for God's word? What do you need to do? What can you do? Think about your life. What can you do to give God's word space in your life? What do you need to do? I want you to think about that. I want you to be honest with yourself about that. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to show you what you need to do. Because as we go on to the rest of the armor, 
the word of God, the law and belt of truth, is essential to be in place. It's important that it's in place in your life. I'm not going to say it must be one minute, five minutes, five hours a day. That's not up to me. That's up to you. You go with what you feel the Lord's showing you. Does that mean that you just got to pick up the Bible and read a scripture? Okay, done. No, it doesn't mean that. It means taking a part of God's word, reading it, studying it, let it become part of you. There are so many studies that we've done together and there are so many studies out there that you can go find. Go find something. Go find something that we've done already. Take one scripture. Allow yourself to meditate upon it. Think about it. Pray it. Speak it. Sing it. Write it. Paint it. You've heard me say this before as well. Do what you've got to do to get that word into your spirit, to get that part of the word as part of your loin belt of truth. Let it become your, sol your solid uh, resting place is God's word. Whatever you've got to do, let's do that together. Okay? Can I pray for all of us as we end this time together? Lord, we thank you that your word is an important part of our lives. We thank you, God, that you've given us your word, that you've given us this lamp unto our feet, that you've given it to us to guide us into all truth, Father, that you've, in this world that is so chaotic and so confusing, your word is what we can hang on to as being true. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, I pray that you will forgive us for not making your word more central and more prominent. Father, I pray that you will help us. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us to find ways that we can maneuver things in our lives and, and add time into our lives so that we can make your word central, that we can put your word in the rightful place in our lives. I pray, Lord, as it girds our waist, as it becomes our loin belt of truth, Lord, that as we make a decision to do that, that the very sound that, that will come out of our mouth will be a sound of authority, will be a sound of power, that when we speak in situations, people are going to recognize this distinctive sound, that as we speak words, it's going to be words of life, it's going to be words of hope, it's going to be words of truth. I thank you, Father, that your word, when it's in us and as we start living it, it will literally change the way that we walk and the way that we talk. Our very mannerisms will be affected and changed and living uprightly will suddenly become so easy because your word is doing the work inside of us. So Father, I pray now for, for you to give each one of us just ideas and ways that we can elevate your word in our life. Help us, Lord. We need your help with us. Remind us. Tap into our, remind us, Lord, to just keep on like hounding us like a dripping tap even. We welcome that, so that, you, that you constantly remind us to be in your word, to take your word as our yes and as our amen. And as we do that, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that our identity and our authority in you will be a set, done deal. The enemy has no chance at lying to us anymore. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen.